We've got another Oklahoma team making its way through the Big 12. Kansas State is the next stop for the Sooners on their way to a probable Big 12 championship game and win. And what's new? We got Jason Ray on the line from Last Word on College Football to break down the Sooners as they prepare for the Wildcats. Jason, how are you doing today? Doing good, Mark. Thanks for having me on again. Absolutely. Uh, Oklahoma is Oklahoma. On offense, they are what they are. They are what they've been, despite some off-season conversation between the two of us and others in regards to how is Jalen Hurts going to match the productivity of a Baker Mayfield and a Kyler Murray. Well, he's done that. How is the offensive line going to replenish all the, the losses to the NFL? Well, they've done that. Marquise Hollywood Brown off to the NFL and tearing up NFL defenses. Well, they've made up for that. Maybe they've not replaced his speed or sheer just run down the field and throw the ball over my head type of uh, a burst out of the gate. But the Oklahoma offense as product uh, productive as it's ever been and prolific. As we look at the defense, though, maybe this is the defense that gets them where they want to go uh, once they match up against the other elite teams in uh, college football. Certainly the schedule is much to to be desired, but at the same time, as yeah. they roll through the Big 12, they are facing better teams. And this is going to be another team that's not great in Kansas State, but it's a productive team. They're four and two coming in, uh, one and two in the Big 12 with a win over TCU. So they're going to face better competition and specifically here, Kansas State. But it's a defense that has maybe, as you put it to me before we started to record, is uh, maybe ahead of uh, where we expected it to be. Yeah, I think that's pretty fair, Mark. You know, like we, like we talked about, they, I think they're, I would say they're substantially ahead of schedule from where they would thought most people thought they would be, you know, you come in, they were dead last in passing um, efficiency defense last year, 129 out of 129. Um, you know, this year they're in the, um, uh, they're in the top quadrant quadrant of the, um, of, of the rankings and, and a couple of key statistics. I think that, um, you know, you can make statistics what they were, but a lot of, a lot of the key um, statistics was, um, their ability to get off the field on third down. Uh, they're in the top 15, I believe, um, y- especially after last week, maybe even the top 10 of uh, third down defense. So they're, they're getting off the field on third down, which is something that they weren't able to do a year ago. Um, they're, um, you know, they're, they're getting stops in the red zone, which is something that they weren't able to do a year ago. Um, and, you know, like, like, like I said, they're, they, were in, they were in the bottom 100 um, in total defense, and right now they're at 29th um, overall. So, so you can tell that they're um, you got a lot of buy-in uh, in, in Grinch's system, but from the players, from the returning players, and you know, I think a lot. Of, there's been a lot of discussion over the last few years. Was it the you know was it the players or was it the coaching? You know, the, over the last few years was um, you know one of the reasons why. Um, Lincoln Raleigh made it made a change mid season last year. Was he felt like felt like they needed a new voice? Um, you know, didn't really think that Ruffin McNeil would make a ton of difference. But you know, at the end of the day, he felt like you know the the way they were going that they they needed a, a different voice. And you know, they've got a lot of different voices this year. Um, you know, with Alex, Alex Grinch, they got Roy Manning um, as well coaching the secondary. So the secondary has been has certainly been much improved. So I, that's, I think the pleasant surprise, at least, you you know, when, when you talk about Oklahoma and you talk about the playoff chances, yeah, they've been to the uh, playoffs in back-to-back years. Um, but, you know, I think every time you would watch ESPN, you would watch sports center, you would watch any kind of preview leading up. One of the things that they would always plaster over the screen is they, they would talk about the defense, defensive rankings, you know, comparatively with, with those top four, you know, I think even even in twenty um, in, in twenty seventeen when Oklahoma faced Georgia, they were still in the you know the eighty the nineties. Um, then obviously last year in the hundreds. Now when you put those up against those schools this year with the Clemsons, with the Alabamas, with the LSU's, um, with the Ohio States, you know it's um, you know it's it's not as much of a laughing matter per you know so to speak. So I think that's been. You know, people that watched the Texas game, that was pretty evident um, in that game, especially in the first half, how, um, you know, 
I think how physical they were on the defensive side of the ball, particularly the, the front seven. I think, you know, having nine, I think they had nine sacks against Texas, um, against Ellinger in that game. So, yeah, I think that's really been the, certainly been the difference maker thus far um, in the season. You know, as we talked about the offense, it's, it's kind of, I mean, it's kind of laughable, um, you know, right? They, you know, like I said, we talked about this so many times. If there, if there was going to be a year under Riley that they would take, um, that that they would take a little bit of a dip, it would be, um, it would be this year. But you know, you look, they're they're still ranked first overall defense, and you look at yards per play, they're over. And this may be last week's statistics, but they're over two and a half yards per play ahead of the second ranked team. I mean, and that's pretty. Um, I mean, that's pretty significant, obviously, you know, you would expect things like that to tail off towards the, um, you know, the middle to end of the year, but, you know, maybe it doesn't, um, you know, they're that, they're that far ahead, um, averaging over 600 yards per game, um, just over 50 points per game. Um, so, you know, Lincoln Riley has that role and he's got Jalen Hurts into, you know, I think, I think some people coming in to say, oh, back-to-back Heisman quarterbacks, but. A lot of people coming in thought that Jalen Hurst, he'd be a nice player. Lincoln would put him in, you know, positions to be successful. But I don't think, you know, I don't think too many people legitimately thought he would be a Heisman candidate, at least not this far um, into the season. And, you know, and he is. We just released our um, last quarter on college football Heisman rankings and, you know, with a Tua injury, he, he kind of jumped up to the, to the to the number one spot. I think – Around the country, him and Joe Burrow are pretty interchangeable one and two this week. But um, yeah, I think it's I think it's pretty incredible what you know what Riley how he's been able to morph that uh, morph that offense. And to your point, they they've not really they've not really replaced um, uh, Marquise Brown's um, you know production. You know, Charleston Rambo has kind of moved into that spot, and he's he's done a good job this year. But you know, C.D. Lamb's their um, is their guy. He's been he's certainly the Certainly, the leading receiver and the number one target um, this year. But you know, one thing, um, one thing, Jalen Hurts is a leading rusher on this team, which you know a lot of people, um, you know, especially as you get down to the the latter part of the year, you know, the wear and tear on that body is a, probably a little bit of a concern. Um, you may not want him running quite as much, uh, you know, towards the end of the year. But at the same time, it's part of their offense that he's been pretty successful with so far this year. Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football, breaking down the game we love each and every uh, day with uh, the best bloggers, broadcasters, and writers in the industry. Analysis from myself as well, as you had uh, seen there on the screen. A couple different ways you can get my college football predictions for this week. One, you can text MR Football at 2760 670 3130. 14 and 7 against the spread last week. Or. Nice. Join our Voice of College football community. Do that. Grab the link in the description section below. So the predictions are just one thing. I'm not an expert. I'm not an odds maker. I'm not a handicap or anything like that. It's something I do fairly well, but I'm not a professional. But the reason we do that is we provide that. And we also an exclusive live stream for you, the fans, each and every week, in which by request, I bring you on. We talk college football with me directly. Uh, so that's a, and a number of other uh, incentives and benefits there, the voice of college football community. So please sign up. So anytime you have this kind of success, Jason, of course, the coach is then start, starting to become linked to other jobs. And when you're at a place like Oklahoma, there are no other real jobs at this level that he's going to ascend to. So it goes to the next level, which, uh, of course, we've seen it happen before where Oklahoma coaches have made their way to the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, Mr. Barry Switzer comes right. to uh, for Alex Grinch. It's okay. He fixed a defense at Oklahoma. He did that at Washington state a few years ago, man, he's a hot commodity. And so then he gets start to, to be rumored and maybe not for specific jobs right now, but as teams start to wind down their seasons and not play up to expectations, they're going to start to be more specific uh, places where people, even if Alex Grinch isn't interested, are going to target him. But it's just kind of a general thought right now. Lincoln Riley to the Dallas Cowboys, if they continue to uh, falter, which they won a big game this past week, but still not playing up to expectations. And for Alex Grinch, it's what head coaching job would he be targeted for? That's kind of the talk out there. 
Yeah, that is uh, that is the top mark, and it's kind of interesting. And maybe, maybe it's just because of the close proximity between Norman and and Dallas, but it seems like every time um, Jerry Jones or, or the Dallas Cowboys are, are, are contemplating making a change, or or it looks like they're you know they're having a tough year, and um, you know they might look at making a change. It always seems to lead with Oklahoma. To your point that you made, Barry Switzer um, made the leap um, after he. Um, step down from Oklahoma, um, and, and then Bob Stoops. Many times he was linked to a possible, um, possible coaching job there. Then um, obviously Lincoln Riley here over the last couple of years with the success at Oklahoma. Um, you know, I think one of the things that probably doesn't make um, make Oklahoma fans um, super secure is the fact that he really hasn't come out and, and said that. Absolutely not. It's not something he's interested in. I think, you know, people that are close to Riley, it's it's something that intrigues him. Not specifically the Dallas Cowboys, but the NFL. I think that's something um, that that he would potentially listen to. I I, I don't know that he would want to get into um, sort of the circus that um, follows the the Dallas Cowboys with, you know, Jerry Jones pretty much calling all the shots. And you wonder what kind of – you know, wonder what kind of a difference that you could you could make as a as a head coach there. So, I would be surprised if he if he made the jump to Dallas. Should they continue to struggle and they make a change with Garrett? Um, however, a few years down the road, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he did um, at some point decide to go to the NFL for another challenge. Especially if Oklahoma is able to win a national championship, you know, within the next you know three to five years. Um, Certainly wouldn't be surprised just from a from another challenge. But on the other side, you, I mean, you got Nick Saban who came out, um, you know, as an example. He came out, um, I think, earlier this year, maybe it was during the summer, and mentioned his biggest regret and his professional life was, you know, leaving LSU and going to Miami. Um, so, you know, it, it's something that he has to think about. The intrigue is probably there. Obviously, you know. You, uh, you know whether you're a player, whether you're a coach. I mean, I think you want to um, you want to get to the highest level. You want to coach or you want to play at the highest level, which obviously would be the would be the NFL on our sport here. But um, it'll be interesting to see you know how that manifests itself, especially if I mean to your point, uh, Mark. You know, there's there's other great jobs in, in college football. You know, obviously you got Alabama, you got places like Texas, you got you know, those blue blood programs, but, um, nothing, nothing probably will be, um, it's not like Oklahoma is a stepping stone job. So, um, we'll be interesting to see how that plays off, plays out. And then, you know, we talked a little bit about the defense with Grinch and, you know, he was, um, I think kind of linked as the, as one of the highest, um, hottest commodities in terms of a defensive coordinator this year. Um, and, and, you know, you mentioned that he did that with Washington state, which is absolutely correct. The thing that was interesting is interesting thus far with, you know, with this stint versus Washington State. It took him a couple of years to kind of get that going at Washington State. Obviously, the the talent level, um, you know, that he had coming into um, Oklahoma versus Washington State was a little bit different, right? So he he jumped already from. Certainly, we don't know how the rest of the season's going to play out, um, but you know, going from you know in the hundreds to 29th. Um, I think the first year with Washington State, they um, they jumped about fifteen to twenty spots in total defense. So he's made a, he's made a bit of a bigger impact here uh, thus far. So he was very quick to say, of course, you know, like we said, this is something that you would expect, um, especially in the middle of the season in a championship run, that your defensive coordinator to say. But he came out and said he's not interested in a head coaching job. Um, right now or he actually said he ever um which you know you know coaches are historically very um not uh, not very honest when it comes to that stuff but yeah it'll be interesting to see that how that go like i said for riley especially if he's able to win a national championship here at oklahoma within within the next you know three to five years does he want to make that jump Got Jason Ray on the line from Last Word on College Football with Oklahoma traveling to Kansas State as a 23-and-a-half-point favorite. 
the Sooners, of course, undefeated, and Kansas State uh, coming in at four and two, one and two in the conference, but coming off a big win against TCU at twenty-four to seventeen, a game in which they barely amassed more than, uh, let's say, two hundred and sixty-six total yards of offense, but found a way to win against the Horn Frogs. Uh, any resistance in this one that you can foresee uh, uh, with Oklahoma going to uh, Manhattan? Um, you know, it's hard to say yes, Mark. Um, Oklahoma has struggled playing up there the last few years, a couple of years ago. I don't know if you, I think a lot of us, a lot of our, our OU folks that watch, watch this podcast will probably re- remember this, but they, they struggled a couple of years ago. Obviously defensively, they struggled. Um, they were down at halftime and I think there was a lot, a lot of feeling that, you know, they might lose that game. Baker Mayfield and Rodney Anderson kind of wheeled them, um, to, to a close win. I believe he had a touchdown, um, run with probably less than about 30 seconds to put them ahead, uh, to win the game. But, you know, honestly, let's, you know, if we're, if we're being truthful here, I think the rest of the season, Oklahoma, their biggest opponent will be themselves. You know, they're going to be, they're going to be double digit favorites through the rest of the year um you know their next two games after this um probably their toughest toughest little stint um of the year they after kansas state they come home to face um iowa state um which is actually playing really well right now um they actually host oklahoma state this weekend which should be a pretty um intriguing game in the big 12 and then you know we talked about the the game of the year in the big 12 was um you know, Oklahoma and Texas in the Red River shootout, you know, it may end up being Oklahoma and Baylor. We talked about that way early in the year, if you remember, Mark, but it was, you know, kind of a sleeper game. It's not probably not going to be much of a sleeper game right now. I think Baylor's, what, 13th or 14th um, in the AP poll this week. Um, and then they, um, I believe they are off this week, and then they host West Virginia um, on Friday night, and then they travel to TCU. They win those two games. You know, you're, you could be looking at a top 10 matchup in, in Waco, which will be um, pretty significant. Um, you know, I think it's – that'll be – certainly that will be the – along with Iowa State, that will be the uh, the challenge, um, at least up to – I mean, coming to the forefront. We will see where Oklahoma lands in the initial college football playoff selection committee's rankings, which come out next week, yep. barring – an unforeseeable upset against Kansas State. But, of course, we get one or two of those just about every week in college football, so who knows? And we almost saw one against Army last year and against Oklahoma State. So, again, nothing can be taken for granted, but this is clearly the best team uh, in the Big 12. Jason Ray from Rest, last word on college football, breaking down the Sooners for us. Jason, we appreciate you stopping by. All right, thanks, Mark.